Hello, everyone. I want to share a story with you. In the 1980s, the chief scientist of the World Health Organization was on his way to a gala, to a celebration. And as he was putting on his tuxedo, his little daughter looked at him, and she asked him where he was going. And he told her that he was on his way to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the eradication of smallpox. And she looked at him, and she said, Daddy, what's smallpox? And he said, exactly. The smallpox vaccine is estimated to have saved over 120 million lives. And I love this story for two reasons. One, it highlights the power of technology. And two, it demonstrates that there are always solutions to seemingly intractable problems. I'm an optimist, and I love thinking about the progress that we've made as a species. And when I think about the quantum leaps that we've made in just a few short centuries, I see that progress through the lens of scientific enlightenment and technological advancement. Technology is essentially a superpower. It has solved so many of the world's greatest challenges. And I believe that scientists and engineers have a supersized capacity to shape the future for the better. In fact, I believe that scientists and engineers, they're the superheroes of our era. And I think we need them now more than ever. Climate change poses an existential threat to our way of life. There are 1.5 billion people who are malnourished or starving in this world. And yes, we may have conquered smallpox, but a child dies every 30 seconds from malaria. Malaria. Did you know that it's estimated that malaria has killed over 50% of the homo sapiens who have ever walked this earth? And did you know that it can cost as little as $2.50 to manufacture and distribute an insecticide-coated mosquito net that can literally save someone's life? There's a famous argument made by the Australian ethicist Peter Singer that had a profound impact on my life. It goes like this. Imagine you're walking in the park in a pair of fancy, brand new shoes, and you're walking by a lake, and you see a child drowning in the water. And you have the ability to jump in and save her. And there's no one else around, but you don't have time to take off your shoes. Do you jump in and save the child? Do you? Yes, of course you do. Yes, of course. I'm like looking at the audience. I'm like, oh, who's not raising their hand? Ah. Of course you save the child. When asked, most people say that you have a moral obligation to save the child. It's morally indefensible not to. They reason that if you are aware of someone in need and you have the means to help, then you have a moral obligation to do what's right. It's your responsibility. Yet I suspect many of us don't feel this way when it comes to things like climate change or global hunger or malaria. Yes, we acknowledge the cosmic injustice of it all, but we think ourselves incapable of doing anything about it, and so we reason that we're not morally responsible. It's as if we see the child, but we can't swim. But this is a myth, and it is a myth that is as pervasive as it is pernicious, and it's because these challenges have solutions. We know that these problems are not intractable. We know that they have answers. There's enough food in the world to feed 15 billion people, Global hunger is not set in stone. More solar energy hits the square mileage of Texas than all of the world's power plants combined. Reliance on fossil fuels is not set in stone. And given that people's lives are at stake, and given that we have the technological capacity to rise to the challenge, I ask, can we afford not to? So back to the superheroes of our era. You would think that armed with such a superpower, and with such morally compelling motivation, you would think that we would see waves of eager, enthusiastic, bright-eyed, idealistic, optimistic, young technologists, scientists, and engineers who are being the change they want to see in this world, and who are harnessing the power of technology to change the world for the better, right? Wrong! In fact, it's too often the exact opposite. There is a vast infrastructural pipeline at play that commodifies brilliance, and it seduces the superheroes of our era with six-figure starting salaries and swanky offices in Silicon Valley and Wall Street. I see the brightest minds of my generation flock westward in an annual pilgrimage to Palo Alto and to Menlo Park so that they can optimize ad algorithms for Mr. Zuckerberg. I love Snapchat. I love Snapchat, don't get me wrong, I really do, but in a world of climate change and inaccessible healthcare and 
gender inequalities, and ocean acidification, and malaria. Like, do we really need all our precious time, our precious technological resources, spent building apps that allow us to send disappearing nudes? This is what I wanted to change. This is what I wanted to change at least just a little bit, to shift the paradigm. I wanted to do my part in changing this at least a little bit. I wanted to show that you have other options. And I wanted to show the superheroes of our era that you have more moral agency than you think. You have a moral responsibility that you don't even know. And that's why, together with one of my closest friends in the world, we created Impact Labs. Impact Labs was designed to inspire and empower the next generation of superheroes. We wanted to create an environment in which young technologists could critically explore how they could optimally leverage their skills for social good. And that's exactly what we did. Last year, we created the inaugural Impact Fellowship, in which we gathered 35 computer science students from all around the world. And for two weeks, we studied advanced software engineering by day from amazing instructors. And by night, we heard from amazing speakers in the social impact arena people from NGOs and think tanks and research institutions and philanthropic organizations and social startups and impact investment firms, people who are leveraging technology to build a more equitable, sustainable world. But the best part was actually when the students themselves, they teamed up with one another and they created their own social startup that addressed one of the UN sustainable development goals. One team of women, to give you an example, they built Airbnb for safe houses. So if you're a victim of domestic abuse, you could log onto this app, and it would safely and anonymously pair you with a volunteer shelter so you could extricate yourself from the violence. Another team, they created a platform that uses SMS-based services to create a heat map of waterborne illnesses so that you can track the spread of contaminated water supplies in the developing world. These are the ideas that emerged in just two weeks when we gave young technologists the audacity to think beyond taxi-hailing apps. And as amazing as it was, we wanted to go bigger. And that's why we put on our second initiative, the Impact Summit which applied these themes to over 250 students. And over the weekend, we heard from over 60 incredible speakers with technical workshops. We put on a career expo, and no Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Twitter, Palantir allowed. We only highlighted the companies that are doing well by doing good. We put on a blockchain for social impact hackathon, and we put on a social startup competition where we were able to give out over $40,000 worth of prize money to young student entrepreneurs working on social ventures. But even these initiatives were just the beginning. I know that there's so much more that we're capable of achieving. I dream of an impact fellowship in every major city across the country. I dream of an impact academy where we're focusing on middle school and high school students and encouraging them to enter STEM fields for social good. I dream of an impact accelerator where we're incubating small enterprises. I dream of an impact fund where we can invest in social entrepreneurs. And I dream of an impact research facility where we can develop cures for humanity's most life-threatening illnesses. I know that we're capable of achieving this. I know it. I just know it in my heart. And I think that the only risk here is in thinking small. Technology is our superpower. Technology is our superpower. But it doesn't just go for those of us that can code. Each and every one of us has a responsibility, an obligation, and no one is exempt. We have the ability to make profound impact on this planet as individuals, but together, when we work collectively, we can be unstoppable. To borrow another's words, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. My goal is to get each and every one of us in this audience and watching this online to think critically about the impact we know that we are capable of achieving in this world. Ask yourself, OK, now how do I get there? What am I uniquely suited to do on this earth? And if I can't achieve that impact today, what are the steps that I can take today so that I can achieve that impact tomorrow? Who are the people I need to surround myself with so that my values don't erode? And what are the skills I'll need to get there? And if I don't have those skills, how do I start learning those skills today? I ask you to envision a world in which we all use our superpowers optimistically and relentlessly. And I envision a world in which I'm putting on my tuxedo to go to the big celebration of 10 years without malaria. And my little girl can look at me and she can say, Daddy, what's malaria? And I can look at her and I can say, exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs>